Jesus has become incredibly popular. His renown is on the rise. He is healing people. He's doing things. A word that consistently appears in the Gospels at this point is people were amazed, both at his teaching and at his miraculous powers. Here in Luke 4 and verse 41, where we pick up today, it says, And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew he was the Christ. Now, we talked about demons, unclean spirits in the New Testament Wednesday night. I hope you had an opportunity to at least, at least view that online because it's very different than the modern idea. Uh, unclean spirits, demons in the New Testament, when they possessed people in almost every single case, they hurt that individual. The people around them are not afraid of them. Uh, much different than somebody that we'll encounter a little later in the book of Luke here who is a leper, which terrifies people. So it's very interesting how people that are gripped with what is described as demon possession are people that are pitied. They're not feared in the New Testament. In any case, it says when they came out of folks, they would testify that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and he did not want them to say that. That's an interesting, an interesting fact. Um, I think it's important for us to remember that uh, Jesus is living in a very dangerous time. There are people that have preceded him claiming to be messiahs who have led revolts and have been killed in the process. And Jesus, I think at the very least, has to be careful with his timing when he will begin to reveal more about his divinity. But for now, he uh, does not want this said as these demons come out of people it's interesting that what Jesus continues to call himself is not the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man. Not that he's not the Son of God, but that he is saying the same thing in a way that is a little bit veiled. The Son of Man is a phrase that appears in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, in which Daniel has a vision and prophesies about one like a son of man who will rule forever. It's clear that this is a Messiah-like figure. But so he's saying that he is a son of God without saying it in such a way as to upset the political and religious leaders. And Jesus always goes around telling people, he who has ears, let him hear. Think about what I'm saying. People that were familiar with the verses in Daniel would understand that this was someone who claimed to be very special. And Jesus uses that phrase, the son of man, 72 times in the gospel to refer to himself. As we continue in the book of Luke, it says, At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. How long had Jesus been healing people? Days, hours, I don't know, but I, at some point it begins to wear you out. People, people coming just in a long line in waves, um, just for a normal person like me, it would try my patience, but for so, even for someone like Jesus who it has compassion on these people, there comes a point at which he needs to get away and recharge. Time alone is an important part of Jesus' life. Not time alone. Time alone with God, I guess, would be the better way to, to put that. And it's interesting that despite so many people who view Jesus in so many ways, he did a great many wonderful things. But he says here that his main mission, what his main purpose is, is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Sure, he's going to help people. He's going to heal people to prove who he is, but that's not his main purpose. His main purpose is to get the good news of the kingdom out. And uh, then here in verse 44, 
Luke speaks in a way that people in Palestine probably would not have said it. He says that he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea, by which Luke means the whole province. For Jews, Judea was that part down south around Jerusalem, and that's not where Jesus is right now. This is not a contradiction, just Luke being an outsider, speaking in a larger terms. And then we come to chapter 5, uh, one of my favorite chapters, one that, um, as you will come to see, challenged my marriage at some point. Here, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So uh, Gennesaret is another word for what we call the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is taking advantage of uh, a situation for a greater purpose, and I think we need to pause and understand exactly what's going on here. The Sea of Galilee was more or less six miles across, which sounds big until you consider Lake Okeechobee's 30 miles across, five times bigger than the Sea of Galilee. In modern times, the Sea of Galilee, as you can see from this uh, modern map on the right, is the water source for the nation of Israel. And so the sea has begun to shrink. Now Israel has built in those little squares along the coast desalinization plants to provide water for the country in a more sustainable way. And you'll see that little dashed line, the desalination plant in the north, they are building a pipeline in order to pump water into the Sea of Galilee and make it what it was back in Jesus' day again. But for now, it continues to be uh, shrinking. Now, it says that Simon and other people around him were fishermen. And um, that was a relatively new career. It had only been around for a generation or two. Not that people hadn't been fishing in the lake, but I'm talking about commercially fishing the lake. Um, most people up into that time were craftsmen and farmers. Uh, fishing had not been mm, typically a big business in Galilee, but by now it had become so because of the great demand from the people in the growing city of Jerusalem for more and more foodstuffs. Now, when we talk about fishing, they're not throwing hooks in. Uh, they're fishing in a much different way, as you can see here with nets. And when we talk about fish in a lake that's only six miles across, we're not talking about big fish. We're talking about fish that you and I would consider more like sardines. These are smaller fish, maybe not quite as small as a sardine, but certainly not much bigger than that. Now the nets that you see here that were still in use when this picture was taken probably 60 years ago, um, the nets were made of flax, which is linen. They, that meant that every morning after you got through with them because you fished at night, you would drag them out onto the land to dry them out. If you did not dry them out, they would rot. They also required constant mending. And so these people here are mending the holes in the nets. And the nets uh, were used in a way that required them to be weighted at one end. And so the weights have to be maintained too. The majority of the fishermen's time was spent doing this. Uh, it's hard to believe, but the fishing part was the easy part. As far as they were concerned, it was this maintenance part that uh, was the hard part. And uh, it was very hard work to do what they did. Now, it was rewarding financially, but it was very hard work. And this is the way that they did it. Now, if you were a very small fisherman, you might use a cast net. I've seen people here in southwest Florida use cast nets in order to catch panfish that they would use in turn to catch bigger fish. And uh, in the lake there, you could catch enough for, I guess, yourself to have a small business. But if you were a businessman like Peter, who had uh, at least uh, three partners, I guess, 
you used what is called a trammel net and it would go in a big circle you would lay it out and then it would float on one end sink actually down to form a circle and then you would pull it in and catch all those fish and that's how it worked and you would do that over and over and over through the night now um, the Sea of Galilee produce these kinds of fish uh, one of the villages on the Sea of Galilee you see there on the west is called Magdala. In Greek it was called Terakia. It was meant the place of salted fish because the fish was not intended to be consumed locally. I mean, I suppose some people ate it, but it was much more valuable to salt it and send it down the road to Jerusalem where it could be sold for a good amount of money. That's where that what they were doing with all this. And so these little fish would be salted and placed, I guess, in barrels or crates and sent down south. It also provided a natural amphitheater for somebody like Jesus to speak. Without amplification like I have, if you don't have a voice like Randy Simmons, you've got to be amplified for people to hear. And this was a great way for large numbers of people to hear. It provided a perfect, acoustically live place um, the, these hard ceilings um, help bounce the sound as we sing uh, back to us. But anyway, large numbers of people, thousands of people could hear Jesus, particularly if he went out a little ways in a boat and spoke toward them. Now this is a picture or a drawing of a first century Galilean fishing boat. It's about two-thirds the size of a school bus. And, uh, and it was also something that had to be maintained. It could be rowed or you could use the sail if the winds were a little calmer to get around the lake and position. It took a great deal of skill to, to make that thing go in a circle and lay those nets. So these guys were pretty good at what they did. Because of the uh, shrinking of the Sea of Galilee, some of the... Uh, um, under the, the, some of the bank has been exposed and about 25 years ago, maybe a little longer than that, they found a first century boat sunk in the mud and they pulled it up and they advertised it at the, as the Jesus boat and you can go see it in Israel in the museum there in Galilee. But it gives you an idea of exactly how large a boat would have been that Peter and the rest of them owned. It says, when he finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Now, I said before that this, uh, this was the passage that, uh, that uh, challenged my marriage, and it was because maybe about the different ways in which my wife and I were raised. Simon Peter answers, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, maybe because of the way I was raised, I hear that as sarcasm. Now, my wife hears it as just honest, above-board communication, but I, mm, I don't know. I, um, Peter is a commercial fisherman with years of experience, and um, Jesus is a craftsman, maybe in wood, maybe in stone, from Nazareth. Um, it's one thing to listen to the preacher preach. It's another thing for him and come to tell you how to do your job. That's a whole lot different. And, and is there a tone in here if it's not just me, maybe is there a tone in here where Peter is a little bit reluctant? Because after all, Jesus is saying, I want you to go out at the wrong time. I want you to go out in the daytime. I want you to go to the wrong place. I want you to go out into the deep water. I want you to drag those nets that you have spent time drying and mending. I want you to drag them back out in the water, and you're going to have to do it all over again once you're done. And and so, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I would, have, uh, I, I would have been very reluctant to do that. 
um, when my wife and I were first married and studying the Bible together, we came to this passage and it created such a disagreement it was hard for us to study after that for a while because, because I was certain he was being sarcastic and she was just offended I would even think that. And I had to learn to live with a woman who was sometimes wrong. But anyway, the, is this a sense, is Peter giving a sense here of professional pride or is he indeed, as my wife would say, showing humble submission? Well, the way he reacts afterward makes me think it's sarcasm, but you judge for yourself. We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. We're professionals. We know what we're doing. But because you say so, okay, we'll go out there. And when they had done this, they enclosed in that great big trammel net a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break and they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. This is an astonishing catch in the daytime. Now, I'm not a fisherman. I don't know the habits of fish. But I do presume that if you are uh, good at fishing here locally, either saltwater or freshwater, you know which times of the day are best to catch fish or the tides or whatever. I'm not sure there really are any tides in the Sea of Galilee, but in any case, um, this was all wrong. This shouldn't happen. You should not be able to catch hardly anything in the daytime, much less this amount that's about to sink two boats. And Simon Peter saw that. He fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. Now, I guess that's the only way I can wrap my mind around Peter's reaction is that Peter is admitting, I didn't believe you at all and really didn't want to do this. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's saying it for another reason. Um, and it is interesting that whereas before Jesus, uh, Peter says to Jesus, Master, I'll go do this, now he says, Lord, I am a sinful man. And those are two very different words. When I was um, just out of college, I worked for uh, Ecker Drugs in their management training program. And I had a manager that I worked under. He was my boss. But one day, I guess about a year in, in walked this large entourage at the head of which was Jack Eckerd. That's a whole different thing. My boss, Jack Eckert, he came and shook my hand and we talked a minute. There's a difference between the boss and the owner and that's the difference between, subtly, between the words that Peter uses. Whereas before he, I think, reluctantly agrees to do something, now he realizes this is completely different. It's one thing to heal the sick, it's another thing to tell people how to do their job better than they have ever known how to do it. And he considers himself, he admits he is a sinful man, perhaps because of his skepticism. For he was, and here's that word again, he was amazed and all who were with him at the catch of fish which they had caught. It shouldn't happen. Wrong place, wrong time, and here they had caught more than they had certainly caught in days. They hadn't caught anything the night before. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Um, Jesus chooses a dramatic way to get these four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, to follow him, uh, to leave their business, to leave their boats. And perhaps this is the only thing that would impress fishermen to follow. Maybe this was the only way Jesus was ever going to get their attention by showing that he knew, had the power over much more than even their highly skilled talents would lead them to believe. And he says, do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And I wonder what Peter must have thought this meant. What does he mean by we're going to be catching men? I would assume that Peter thinks we are going to 
start a movement. We're going to add people to it. And I don't know at this point if Peter understands that it's not as much an army as many of Jesus' Messiah predecessors have been, or is it going to be a movement of people moved in the heart? But Peter's going to find out. And you have to understand the sacrifice that these men are making. The, they're small business owners. Now, undoubtedly, they have employees that they can turn this business over to, but that's different than doing it yourself. The four of them would not be working as hard as they were if their labor wasn't necessary. And here they're stepping out on faith. Now, because they are commercial fishermen, they're better off than many people in Galilee. They're able to work year-round. Farmers obviously work seasonally. But as commercial fishermen, they can have an income year-round, which is a great blessing. They're making quite a sacrifice. And I can only imagine when Simon Peter goes home to his wife and says, you know, I'm going to be leaving for a while. And the questions that he has to answer and the faith that their families have to have because they are all stepping off into an unknown future. But they've been deeply impressed by a man who is not just a great teacher, not just a miracle worker, but someone who they believe now is something incredibly different. Someone perhaps who has even been prophesied. And then we come to the next story in Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, leprosy in the Bible seems to be somewhat different than leprosy today. Um, and I don't know if like the Spanish flu, the virus has become less virulent in our day because according to the Guinness Book of World Records, leprosy is among the hardest diseases to catch nowadays in the 20th, 21st century. But whatever they're talking about here in the Bible is something people are terrified of catching. Now it may be that it's just not so much that it's highly contagious, as much as it is, if you get it, it's horrible, and there's no cure for it. Um, uh, and, uh, but today, I know up until the 1960s, and they may still be there, there were two leper colonies in the United States, one on an island in Hawaii and one in Louisiana. Um, modern medicines have pretty much eliminated anyone having to live uh, with the symptoms of this disease long term. But when you lived in Jesus' day, there were these rules for lepers. You could not come within six feet of another person, including your own family. Once you were diagnosed with leprosy, you would never know human intimacy again. That's a terrible, terrible thing. You could not come within 150 feet of people if you were upwind. In other words, if the wind is blowing behind me toward Dr. Guttery, i got to move further away. That was the law. And they would be punished or killed if they didn't obey it. You have to wear torn clothing so people can tell from a distance what you are. Your hair has to hang loose so that you can't disguise yourself. In fact, you're required to do the opposite. People have to know that you have this disease so everyone can stay away. If anyone inadvertently begins to come toward you, you are required to shout, unclean, unclean, whenever someone approached. And you had to live your life alone, or at the best you could do is to live with other lepers. You were completely dependent on alms. You would have a basket out by the road and stand off back here and hope people put little pieces of money in your basket. It was a hard, hard way. You did not have a long life if you were a leper. And to add to your burden, uh, the Pharisees particularly taught that illness was the result of sin in your life. So if you had leprosy, how bad a sinner must you be? 
And this is one of the reasons why, peop, why the Pharisees in particular could never understand why Jesus hung out with sick people. Because they're all sinners. They're all bad folk. Why are you wasting your time with the bad people when you should be with the good? Now, notice how this man breaks all the rules. He comes into town. He comes near to Jesus. And he doesn't issue any warning. He, he's so determined he literally is risking his life to come and be at the feet of Jesus because he believes so much that Jesus can cure him. Now, Jesus has cured lepers before this. Undoubtedly, the fame of that had spread, and uh, this man was taking advantage of maybe the only chance he would ever have to live a normal life. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. So Jesus breaks the law and does something that should never be done and touches the man. Because if you touch a leper, you become unclean and you have to go through all this ritual and quarantine. Oh, it's a big deal. But this leper is immediately healed and I guess that would kind of confound the law keepers exactly what to do if you touch someone who's no longer a leper I don't know, it gets complicated. But certainly, Jesus shows that he has compassion, that he's willing, and power that cures in an instant. And then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. In the Old Testament, if by some miracle you no longer evident symptoms of leprosy. You had to go through a, a ritual cleansing process to be restored to the community. And Jesus tells him, follow the law. But Jesus orders him, just like he had to the demons that came out of people, don't tell anyone. Why would Jesus do that? Well, I can think of a few reasons. Because obviously people are going to find out, isn't that Joe who was the leper down the road and now he's walking around here bright as life? What's going on? What's happened? I think one reason Jesus could do it is to be seen as humble. And I think that was an important message to give to people. In other words, don't turn your successes into um, advertisements for your greatness. It's better if people do it of their own volition. Undoubtedly, this man is going to. But Jesus at least will get credit for telling him, don't be doing this. Don't be going trumpeting what happened. I think another reason Jesus could tell him, don't be telling people this, is because, look, I'm happy to heal you, but I do not need a steady stream of lepers coming to me while I'm trying to preach. Not that he doesn't have compassion on people, but there, there are limits to what he can do because his number one job is, is bringing the good news of the kingdom. I think another reason is to keep a lower political profile. His time has not yet come, and he is trying to perhaps limit the sensation that he is becoming. Um, as I've said many times, the Romans were like my parents on vacation. My brother and I would be in the back seat, and of course, his only purpose in life was to annoy me. And we would be fussing in the back seat, and Dad would say, I'm going to stop this car and spank both of you if you don't stop. Dad did not ask, now tell me exactly how it happened, tell me what, try to adjudicate and rule. No, no. He was there to keep the peace and keep the car going down the road, and that's how the Romans were. They really didn't care what went on in the province as long as taxes kept being paid and there was general peace. And as long as Jesus could keep a somewhat lower profile, then they, he would be beneath their notice. I think another reason uh, Jesus tells this leper, don't tell anyone, is to go first go do your obligation to the law. Let the priests know you will be a witness to them. It'll, rather than Jesus coming and preaching directly to the priests, this man will do it for them, for him. But the news about Jesus was spreading even farther. 
despite him telling people, don't tell anyone about this. And large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Without newspapers, the, the news is spreading word of mouth like wildfire. Depending on what, how large a town you live in, uh, sometimes when something happens, the people know quicker than if it was in the newspaper. And things spread really quickly. Uh, Jesus has, is getting to the point that he cannot go from town to town without large crowds either coming out to him or following him. Um, in the book of John, he adds to this problem by feeding them. You start feeding people, and they're going to start following you even more. Um, and they come to both hear him, and if they're sick or have people who are sick, they bring them to him to be healed. And again, there are limits. Jesus can't just sit down on a stool and have everybody in the province come and be touched by him. He has to be about his father's business. And so Jesus, I think, is, is emotionally drained, and from time to time, he has to slip away to a quiet place and pray. And, and it's not just time to time. The word used here is often he would do that. And that is the price of leadership. You know, when I was a boy, I, I remember asking my dad, um, wouldn't it be fun to be president someday? And he said, heavens no, I wouldn't want to be president. And I, that just, I was thunderstruck. Why wouldn't you want to be president and be so important and have all those people around you jumping at your every whim? And he said, you don't understand that, that you're living in a fishbowl. You've got so much uh, uh, call upon your time. I just don't think it'd be any fun at all. And when a person is a leader, it can be difficult. Because who does the leader talk to? Who can he pour his heart out to? Now, Jesus is a, is a um, unique case. But for a, a regular person who is a leader, who can he safely share his frustrations with without it coming back on him? It, it's, it's very easy to get drained as a leader, and you need times to recharge. And sometimes people don't understand that. They expect the leader to always be on, always be up and positive and about. But even Jesus needs times to slip away and be by himself, and in his case, to pray. Continuing in Luke 5, On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Now, um, it's imp I think it's important to pause and, and understand exactly the times that Jesus lived in. Um, the Jews lost their independence, oh, about 300 years before Jesus was born. Um, when... Uh, uh, well, even before that, 600 years before, 700, when they lost it to the Babylonians. Uh, and then the Persians took over the Babylonians and, and ruled Judea with a more or less easy hand. And then 300 years before Jesus, Alexander the Great came through. And uh, they weren't very harsh, typically, early on in their rule, uh, but they became so. But when Jews found themselves answerable to other people, two groups of Jewish leaders came into existence. The first would be the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees are more or less the same thing as the priests in Jerusalem. These people, particularly the high priest, has the responsibility of, of interfacing with these Gentile rulers. And at best, they are going to have to play a game of political twister on behalf of their nation to try to keep it safe, to try to keep it religious, but to try to follow with what the conqueror wants to be done. And that's not easy. 
um, if you were going to put the best possible face on it, I think that the Sadducees looked at themselves as sin eaters. They would do the bad things for the sake of the people. And that way the people could be free, more or less, to worship God. And they would take the brunt of what had to be done. The Sadducees represented about 2% of the Jews. They, uh, unfortunately, to put a bad picture on it, as often happens when you are in a position of power, that power corrupts you. And they uh, would use their relationship with the conqueror, whether it was the Persians or the Greeks or the Romans now, uh, in order to amass um, treasure. They got a cut. They were enjoying a certain level of wealth because of their status. Um, and so regardless of what maybe their intentions were to do the hard thing, uh, they had become, in the eyes of most everybody, corrupt. And then you had the Pharisees. The Pharisees, more or less, were the rabbis out in the villages. Whereas the Sadducees were concentrated in Jerusalem among the priests, the Pharisees were the people out in the villages. And they had the luxury, as it were, to be the opposition, to tell the people why the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans were bad, to call them to continue to follow the law. They were looked at by the people as heroes. It's hard for you to understand that because we read the New Testament and we see Jesus is running battle with them because of the choices they made and the things that they taught. But for the Pharisees, who represented about 5% of the people, um, they were held in extremely high regard. The Pharisees, that word literally means separated ones. They held themselves apart. They held themselves as examples. The people would look up to them as supermen of a sort, of, of faithful followers of the old law. Um, they, but they not only followed the written law, they taught that just as important as the written law were the traditions, the oral traditions that had supposedly been passed down from generation to generation since the time of Moses. And those traditions mattered as much to them as the written law. And that's where Jesus was butting heads with them. Because their traditions um, were not at all uh, what the law meant in many cases. Um, they also uh, believed very strongly in an afterlife. The Sadducees did not. Um, they believed that this was all there is and then you die. And uh, the Pharisees taught that there was an afterlife and uh, they were in constant conflict with the Sadducees over that. You might recall an incident in the life of Paul where he is arrested in Jerusalem and he has the presence of mind to say, you know, I'm being persecuted because I believe in an afterlife. And then the Pharisees support him and the Sadducees don't and they fight and fight. And anyway, Paul gets off here. But anyhow, the um, Pharisees taught, and it is still believed by Orthodox Jews today, that there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. Now, <clears throat> For an average person like Joseph, maybe a carpenter or a stonemason, or Simon and Andrew, fishermen, they do not have the time to learn 613 laws or to keep them perfectly. But if you're a Pharisee, that's your job. That's what you do. And so you, <clears throat> the people looked to you to do what they could not, to be the example to everyone both in what you knew and how you acted. And so you would wear a different kind of costume. You knew that person was a Pharisee. Um, whether it was their phylacteries or their tassels or whatever, you knew, boy, this guy, this guy is something special. Not in a critical way. The average person would look up to him. And there were always public shows of piety. Remember, um, where Jesus was in the temple and a Pharisee came to put money in the collection box and said, hey, hey, 
hey, hey, hey, I'm about to put big money here in the collection box. And people would stand and look and, oh, oh, boy. And he would do that. And Jesus said, well, he's received his reward already. They, they, they and the people thought that it was important to show just how pious they were. Now, um, only a very small number of people could afford to be Pharisees, the very best and brightest teachers. The next level down would be the village rabbi who would be a teacher of the law. He was kind of the junior league Pharisee. But they were all rabbis by and large, all teachers, and uh, very serious about what they believed. Now it's very interesting that um, um, Christianity was able to convert some Pharisees, Nicodemus, maybe Joseph of Arimathea, certainly Saul of Tarsus. People that were Pharisees could be converted, but we don't know of anyone who was a Sadducee that was converted. It says that these teachers of the law, these Pharisees, were in every village as they were, and they were coming to hear this new teacher this amazing teacher. We've got to come hear what this man has to say. And they come not just from Jesus' immediate surroundings, but from all the Jewish villages in the north and Galilee, from the Jewish villages in the south and Judea, and from the big urban center in Jerusalem. And J Jesus is filled with power. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. And so here is a very dramatic story in which all these teachers of the law, all these Pharisees, um, probably even if they've come from Jerusalem, maybe even a sprinkling of Sadducees, they're all gathered as witness for what will now happen. 